Hey guys, how's it going? So the last time we left off, we were talking about 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Now, let's continue talking about what happens with glycolysis and start talking about the Krebs cycle and pyruvate dehydrogenase. Okay, so let's continue. 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is going to react with a phosphoglycerate kinase. Now, we've talked about kinases before, so we know that there's a transfer of a phosphor group. But in this case, it's a little different. We're transferring a phosphor group from 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate onto ATP. Now, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is a high energy molecule. So moving the phosphor group from 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate onto ATP is more favorable. What we're left with is 3-phosphoglycerate. Now we formed one ATP. Okay. Now 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate sorry, 3-phosphoglycerate is going to react with a phosphoglycerate mutase. So what's going to happen is we're going to go from 3-phosphoglycerate to 2-phosphoglycerate. Really, the only difference between the two is that we move the phosphor group from the third carbon to the second carbon. Okay, so now let's look at what happens next. In the following reaction, we react 2-phosphoglycerate with an enolase which creates phosphophenylpyruvate, or PEP. Now, it's kind of hard to see what is happening with my graphics, so let's actually look at the actual chemical bonds so we can see what's happening. So if we look here, here we have 2-phosphoglycerate, the enolase, the removal of water, and the formation of a double bond. We created here phosphophenylpyruvate. Now, Phosphophenylpyruvate is a high, high energy molecule. So now let's go back to the graphic. So, once again, we've created a high energy molecule. So, we react it with another kinase to transfer the phosphor group from PEP to ADP, to creating another ATP. Now we've created two ATPs. But we gotta remember, going back to our reaction, we created two G3Ps. So at this point, we've created four ATPs. But we gotta remember, we used some ATPs in the beginning. We used an ATP to form glucose 6-phosphate, and we used an ATP to form fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So we created four total, but we used two for a net of two ATPs through glycolysis. Okay, now, when we reacted phosphophenylpyruvate with pyruvate kinase, we formed pyruvate. Pyruvate is the final product of glycolysis. So, let's start talking about what happens next. Before we start talking about what happens next, let's start talking about the mitochondria a little bit. So, the mitochondria, as we know, is an organelle in the animal cell. But, before we continue talking, we have to talk about specific regions within the mitochondria. So the mitochondria has two regions in which it has a membrane layer. It has an inner membrane and an outer membrane, okay? And the regions have specific chemical reactions. So the space between the inner and the outer membranes is what's called the inner membrane space. The most, the space within the inner membrane is called the matrix. So the matrix is where we're gonna see the Krebs cycle the matrix is where we're going to see pyruvate dehydrogenase. And the inner membrane space is where we're going to see the increase of proton gradient when we talk about electron transport chain. Okay, so now let's get start talking about the Krebs cycle. So, as I mentioned, pyruvate is going to go and transfer all the way to the matrix. And at the matrix, it's going to react with pyruvate dehydrogenase to form acetylcholate. So let's look at that enzyme. Pyruvate dehydrogenase is a three enzyme, five coenzyme system. And so what it's going to do, it's going to couple the oxidation of carbon forming CO2, the reduction of NAD plus to form acetyl-CoA. Now, acetyl-CoA is a functional group in the sense that this is sulfur and this is CoA. Now, CoA has a chemical structure but it's usually referred to as just CoA. So, 
We're going to be seeing a lot of these NADHs as we continue talking about cellular respiration, so I kind of want to talk a little bit about it. Okay, so this is the molecule, and it's considered an electron carrier. The reason being is that throughout a lot of these reactions, and we've seen it in glycolysis as well, we're reducing NADH, and NAD plus is acting as an oxidizing agent. Now, this is really important because NADH is then going to go and oxidize and deposit electrons in the electron transport chain. And so what happens is these are really important. And moving on, we're going to see them in the Krebs cycle and how they feed into the different protein complexes. Okay, so let's go back to talking about acetylcholine. Um, oops, here we go, acetylcholine. So we went from something that had three carbons to something that now has two because this carbon got fully oxidized. All right. So pyruvate reacts with pyruvate dehydrogenase to form acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is what's going to enter the Krebs cycle. Before I start talking about the, the specific reactions of the Krebs cycle, I think it would be a good idea to just talk about it holistically first. The reason why it's a good idea to look at the Krebs cycle holistically before we analyze each of the specific reactions is that we got to understand in the beginning of the Krebs cycle, we're going to react oxaloacetate with acetyl-CoA this acetylcholate coming in from the reaction of pyruvate with pyruvate dehydrogenase. It's going to go throughout the cycle, and by the end of the cycle, we're going to form oxaloacetate again. A lot of these reactions are coupling the oxidation of a carbon with the reduction of NAD plus to form NADH. Okay? And so a lot of these NADHs are going to be fed into the electron transport chain that we're going to look at after. All right, so let's start diving into one of the first reactions. One of the first reactions is the acetylcholate reacting with oxaloacetate. Now, when we think about the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle, it's a really good idea to keep the number of carbons each intermediate has. So here we're going from two carbons, four carbons to create a six carbon molecule. So acetylcholate and oxaloacetate react with citrate synthase to create citrate. Now, the acetylcholate group is a very good leaving group, and that's what kind of helps this reaction go through as the CoA group leaves. Now, citrate is going to react with an oconotase. It's going to, water is going to leave, and we're going to form a double bond. Now, my graphics don't do the best job at showing this double bond, so let's refer to my notes. So, as we can see here, our citrate is going to react with the conotase. Water is going to leave. We're going to form that double bond. It's going to react again with an aconotase. Water is going to be reintroduced, and we're going to form isocitrate. Now, the only difference between citrate and isocitrate is the flipping of the OH group. See, the OH group is on this carbon here, and now by the time we have isocitrate, it's on the alternate one. And so now proceeding with the Krebs cycle, we're going to be working with isocitrate. Okay, so now let's refer back to the doodles. Okay, so we have six cis aconitate. It's going to react again with an aconitase to form isocitrate. So we see the OH group here versus here. Okay, so let's move on. Isocitrate is going to react with an isocitrate dehydrogenase. A carbon is going to be oxidized, and NAD plus is going to be reduced. And so here we kicked out one CO2. This is the carbon that was being oxidized. So we went from something that had six carbons to now something that has five. And we produced a new NADH molecule. Okay, now we're at alpha ketoglutarate. The next step is going to be alpha ketoglutarate is going to react with an alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. This is going to couple the oxidation of another carbon with a reduction of NAD plus to form succinyl CoA. So we have a new CoA group being introduced. Now, I think this is a good place to stop for this video. And on the following video, I'll finish the crab cycle, the last few steps of it and talk all about the electron transport chain. Okay, thank you so much, and see you next time.